nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, so uh, why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. My name is Gerhard Klimek. Uh, I welcome you to this presentation or recitation on modeling and simulation for semiconductor devices, specifically to introduce that in your classrooms. And I'd like to give you a brief overview of what is that tool set called Abacus. And um, I'll, I'll start with the general mission of uh, NanoHub per se. Uh, we're really trying to reach students, researchers, and instructors. And we really have, in a sense, four high-level ideas that we want to uh, approach our users with. Well, you can do model and modeling and simulation, and we have a bunch of apps, over 500 and tools, and that's one panel. We want to foster learning and teaching, and that is one of the focal points here today. We also want to enable people to develop software and uh, enable them to share their software and their best practices. And that would be the fourth item to share and publish when there is a tool that is available uh, that people have worked on a research uh, tool to enable others to utilize it. So one of those such tool sets, actually it's multiple tools, um, can be as, uh, assembled in what we call simulation powered curriculum. So that you find here on the homepage at the simulation powered curriculum. And if I click on this, um, you'll see an overview. And the concept here is really to introduce modeling and simulation almost like an as virtual environment into your classroom. And we have a couple of them that deal uh, here is sort of a list on the left uh, with uh, quantum mechanics, computational nanoscience, a nanoscience survey course, computational electronics aspects, general chemistry, and Abacus, the semiconductor understanding of devices. So if I click on this, we'll get to this Abacus, which is really geared towards the introduction of semiconductor devices. And what this is about is really, the idea was that NanoHub has so many tools that um, allow people to model a variety of things, typically semiconductor devices, nanoelectronics, some nanophotonics, and related areas that it was hard for faculty members to find things. And um, a couple of years ago, quite a while, we thought, well, we can put together a package that allows people to just have a one-stop shop of where they can teach semiconductor devices. And it really mimics a typical course in devices. So. Uh, this is maybe, maybe that's going to be your homepage, if you will, nanohub slash group slash abacus. And what this group has is really an assembly overview of what is in the tool set. And a typical tool that I, uh, <clears throat> course that I teach in at Purdue would cover uh, crystal structures, band models, some bulk semiconductors. Then it dives into PN junctions, then I cover bipolar junction transistors, MOS caps, and then MOSFETs. I think that mimics, roughly speaking, what a typical semiconductor course does. And depending on who your audience is, um, you can um, uh, scale down, depending on how deep you want to dive in your course. And with that, I would like to start with actually asking Amy to pop up a uh, a poll. I would like to hear a little bit from you on uh, what are your interests, what's a little bit of your background, and if you would please um, um, answer some of the poll questions. You can do that while I keep talking. It's a kind of trivial thing to do. You can scroll up on your right. It's just four questions that deal with who do you teach, what is the topic you're teaching? And maybe there's one we didn't cover. And then whether you, you teach alone or whether you uh, have a teaching assistant. And uh, of course, we would love to invite your teaching assistant as well to a presentation like this. Or whether you work with a peer faculty, and you know, we would love to 
have, of course, your peer faculty involved as well. So if you could maybe answer those questions, that would be great. And we'll get some answers pretty quick here. Um, in the meantime, um, I mean, I have had a passion for semiconductors for some 30 plus years. And um, I was always driven by understanding what happens when you drive semiconductors to the nanometer scale. That was for the last 30 plus years, what I was interested in when I was introduced to nanoelectronics really in 1988 with Supriya Data here at Purdue, where I was a one year exchange student. Actually, he inspired me in many ways to stay in the US and pursue this topic. We didn't call it nanoelectronics then, we called it quantum electronics. So that sounded cool. And at that time, we already could see, if you look at Moore's law, that at some point, if we're lucky enough, we're going to reach device scales that uh, are at a scale where quantum effects are going to be critical. And I'm here to tell you, this is what we reached about six, eight years ago. And a course like this is the introduction to some of this, these aspects of what is critical. And in fact, I began to restructure my course a little bit where I put bipolar junction transistors at the tail end and I introduced projects on quantum dots and nano wires into my course where I let the students explore those virtually in projects that run for two or three weeks. So uh, with that, I would uh, like to sort of just dive in some of the the overview of what's in here. So you've seen you see some animations here. These are pictures of crystal structures. You know the buckyball is a little bit for cuteness, and I'm not sure many of you couple uh, cover buckyballs, but we, certainly we look at crystals and um, um, the various Brave crystals. And in, in my course, I'm not sure you cover that in. In, in your undergrad course, then we, um, so here's the overview on crystal structures. So you can look at a variety of uh, crystals and that's what I want to demo to you today. Um, we have actually an older version of this crystal viewer and we have a newer fancy version that is sort of um, uh, web-based, uh, not, um, you know, if you into software, like X11 motif based. So I'll show you the two versions. But then in my class, I dive into the formation of band structure. And I do that with a method of transmission coefficients. But of course, you can also do that with a traditional chronic penny lab um, or penny model. And I'll, I'll show some of that in week three of the recitation session. Um, what I, what I cover really in the next week of what I wanted to demonstrate is the PN Junction Lab, where students can really get a feeling for PN junctions and uh, what the charge distributions are, what a depletion region is, and that if you make junctions shallow, what, what the depletion region and charge distributions look like. And uh, uh, then in the, in starting January, the first session there will focus on on bulk semiconductors, or I might cover more of the, um, the MOS capacitors already. So we'll 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 do some details there and figure out what's next. And I would love to hear your feedback of what you would like to hear next. And I'd like this to be maybe ten minutes of overview of tool demo, and then I would love to invite you to to give some some questions of what you would like to see. Can you do X? Can you do Y? Why can't you do Z? And uh, I'd like to hear back from you rather than this um, being a, a death by PowerPoint. So there's no PowerPoint here today. I'm, I'm really flying by wire and I'm demoing what is on the site today. So so later on, uh, I'm sure you, you teach uh, uh, capacitors, MOS capacitors. We have some exercises that go along with some of these tools. And you do introduce that in your class. I will demo that and then MOSFETs, uh, where you can really simply um, help students uh, model large FETs in, in, a, in an industrial strength tool. 
and and then see what happens as you make things smaller and how things break down uh, in a traditional MOSFET when you make it down to the nanoscale. So with that, I think we might be very close to the uh, poll questions. If, um, if uh, Amy, could you share the, the results roughly? That would be awesome. Yeah, I see it here right now on my screen. Um, I think everybody roughly should see it. Um, so looks like the majority is teaching undergrad and grad students. Uh, the majority, well, yeah, the majority teaches semiconductors and then there's materials as, as a big number. Uh, some process modeling folks. So we have tools for those um, categories as well. Electromagnetics, quantum mechanics. I can uh, answer questions or point you to some tools as well. There's other. And I can't see the summary of other. I'll be, I'll be interested. So we have seventy people here, and <clears throat> some have support um, by a teaching assistant, but most of you uh, teach alone. So that gives me an idea as well. So awesome! Thank you. Thanks for answering the poll question. This is this is uh, very helpful. So. Um, let me, I'm going to close my poll result here. So here we are, I'm going to go back to the overview page. And, uh, so I gave you this group page is a little bit like a wiki. We can edit this and add figures as they emerge. And if I make a new animation, I can add it, the editors in the group. This is a way of nano hub to manage content that is, um, within a group that has certain access mechanisms. This group is open to anybody in the world, so there's no specific access control, but there's other groups where we can uh, manage it that only um, you get there by inv invitation, for example, or um, or it's open, but uh, you have to apply to get into it and get approved by a manager. So, so if I uh, dive into any one of these, these tools here, so here's this crystal viewer, so if I click on this, I will get to Abacus, the tool. And uh, the tool is a publication on NanoHub. Actually, believe it or not, these tools are listed now in the Web of Science uh, as a proper publication. So if you have things to share, teaching materials, etc., this might be a worthwhile thing to do as well. So, so either way, um, so you can in order to launch a tool, you do have to be logged in. Uh, let me show you that we keep track of usage statistics. We look if people cite specific tools. So this is reasonably low citations, three citations. So this is an educational tool. There's some questions and there's some reviews. There's wishes people put forward for improvements. So this is how we categorize um, really any tool that we have on NanoHub. And uh, I did some updates uh, last night, actually a couple of weeks ago, and they got published last night. So, so if I look at launch tool, you'll see a spinning wheel and it launches a tool. And it's kind of cool. It's hard from the technology to make out. What you see is actually a virtual machine that is running, in this case, in San Diego. And it's piping a screen output into your browser. <clears throat> well, it's piping a screen output in my browser and I'm broadcasting to you my browser. So that's a couple of interesting network aspects. And what you see here is sort of a pictorial view of the various tools that are in, in this tool set. So you can, uh, so here's a crystal viewer, as I mentioned, there's periodic potential lab. Here's a way of deriving band structure from transmission coefficients. I've included more modern nanowire band structure lab or ultra thin body band structures. You can explore that here. And here, these two are carrier statistics and drift diffusion, uh, where you have just bulk semiconductors, basically the fundamentals of semiconductor physics. 
And then you can dive into the PN junction lab and bipolar junction transistor, MOS caps, and MOSFETs. And the three on the bottom are the older versions of what the three on the top are, more or less. So, so you might find, I'm going to compare these two today. So I'm going to dive into the Crystal Viewer Lab, the new release. And the old older one basically uh, runs inside this gray frame. You can also reach these tools by clicking on this on this list here, and you can reach them. So if I uh, click on the Crystal Viewer here, it's the same as if click on down here. So let me launch this guy here. It launches two tabs, and some tools have homework assignments. So here, here they are, homework assignment on Crystal Viewer. And on this tab, you can find basically the fundamental tool. Um, I can also click on here in the Crystal Viewer lab, and the new version is kind of cool. It, it, it runs a little bit um, uh, outside of this box, but has a modern graphical interface. So we're in the process of modernizing some of these tools that we've had for a while. And this launches a Jupyter Notebook, actually, in a form that is more appealing. And it takes about 45 seconds or so to, to fully assemble. But there you are. You have um, a crystal uh, that is here in silicon. It's a diamond crystal. And you have a, a textbook basis that typically you have. Uh, you can rotate this around. You can play with it. You can look at it from from distant crystal directions. Um, you can rotate it um, in one, one, one direction, for example. And you can have multiple uh, representations of this crystal. So. You can uh, look at, for example, the minimal basis, and that's actually uh, just two atoms. And you can put that also into a repeated basis uh, like this, where this is uh, really the not the minimalistic, but a simple uh, repeated basis. I think the really interesting thing is if you want to have your students look at bigger crystals. So I remember when I was a student, my faculty member in Germany carried this, this physical, you know, balls on a uh, metal um, stick model into the classroom. And he handed it to a few trusted students in the first or second row and asked them, please, not to break it. And they could fiddle futz around in this with a, in a class size of 150 or 200 people, or whatever was in the lecture hall. It was a pretty big class when I took it. So it was, uh, unless you're one of the first uh, row or second row students, uh, you couldn't really lay a handle, uh, hand on this um, crystal. So here, your students can lay a hand on crystals, and they can um, rotate them into, say, um, uh, one or all uh, crystal direction. Um, they can rotate it into a one, one, o. And what I have my students do actually in my class, I have them do that. And I actually just ask them, rotate the crystal around into the various planes and give me a screen dump and copy and paste that over into your uh, homework assignment. And sort of as evidence that they actually played with this a little bit. And um, well, then you can do this one, one, one direction. And you can also do other cool things. You can, uh, for example, turn on a Miller plane, like um, a 111 plane. And that takes a, a second to do. And here you go, you have now a 111 plane. And you might ask your students, well, how many atoms or bonds are free on a 111 surface? So, meaning how reactive would that silicon surface be if you uh, expose it? Um, you can move that plane around and um, look at it this well, rotate it too far, and you see if it's down in the corner like this, it's pretty clean cut uh, 110 plane. Uh, you can put in other planes as well. Now, 
um, if you said, well, this is cute, but I would like to have other configurations, like make this crystal larger, you can do so by clicking on these, these settings. And so this, this box that I showed you was uh, three by three by three unit cells large, and you can change those numbers and it can do its thing and calculate it, but no problem. There's other crystals, uh, I mean, you can, germanium is, the atoms might be a different color in the representation, but it looks like silicon. So here's zinc blender, and here's a textbook basis of zinc blender. And here this tool uh, goes out and, and pulled in uh, gallium arsenide. It basically looks like um, silicon, except of course you have two atoms in here and the symmetry therefore is slightly different. But other than that, it looks roughly similar. There's wurzite, here's a gallium nitride cell. And here's your gallium nitride cell. Uh, we can argue a little bit about the coloring here. This is brown and red. There's a color mapping to different atoms. Um, room for improvement, let's say, to get better contrast. And again, you can pull up the crystal here and it builds the bigger structure. And here we go. So now, you know, if you look down, down through the vertical axis of Zinc Blender, you see, of course, a hexagon type shape if you look here you see the the different stacking orders a b c a b c stacking orders which uh, you might want to show your students i frankly i i think i assign uh, a visualization of uh, the wurzite cell uh, in my class but i i don't spend much time on wurzites i do spend time early on in the class of visualizing uh, Bravi lattices, where we start out, of course, with a simple cubic. Here you go, and you can and you can build a bigger crystals. And so this might be a three by three by three again. Here we go. It's actually two by two cells, and and you can in the cubic arrangement you can turn on body centered cubic, and it's building up the model right now. Uh, sometimes when you change. The structure, it actually has to go back to the server and, and request information if it's not preloaded. And here we are, here is now a body-centered cubic, larger crystal. And it's harder to tell here, right? Because there's all these connections. Um, for So we have all the, the standard Brave cells in here. And then we have a little bit more, um, so that's that's all here. So you can see the simple hexagonal, you can see the, click too fast. So now it's trying to retrieve the, also the tri, uh, tri, 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 trigonal cell. See the symmetry here, there's the hexagonal cell. So you can really explore the Bravi lattice. And this looks actually reasonably well also in this particular tool on a um on a on a smaller device and again if i look at hexagonal from the top i see the hexagon and if i look from the side i see um, the different stacking orders like this so uh, you can explore bravi uh, lattices you can do um, uh, fi finally materials in here and just for completeness i, I wanted to show you also oh, Okay, so I thought I launched also the crystal view of the original version. Yeah, here we go. So we have a similar version to this where um, here you basically see again the silicon unit cell. Um, the interface is slightly different. The tool under the hood that generates all of this is still the Nemo tool that uh, um, that generates all the coordination. We need that for nanoelectronics. So we're kind of abusing a, a nanoelectronic modeling tool for that. So you can get the same results, but you would be completely confined in this abacus tool set in this framework. And within the framework, you can then launch other tools, as I mentioned. 
So you launch a bunch of these tools. I think I'm pretty long already. I'm at 26 minutes. I talked too long. I, I want to take some questions on, and maybe hear what your questions are, what your concerns are, how, what would you want to do? What didn't you see yet? Just maybe put them in the chat and that would be awesome to see. So Jack, Jack Jew asked if it was possible to view other Miller planes, even some unusual ones. Um, yes. So in this tool here, we have predefined the planes. So there's six here, but in the generalized version, the older version, I believe you can put in any plane. So let's look here. Crystals, raw Miller plane. So you guys can see my, yeah, you can see my screen. So draw Miller plane, yes. And then, um, okay, shoot, which plane would you want? Let's crash the tool. Let's see what happens. So he said two, a big... two, 13 minus nine. All right. Sounds cool. I'm going to make the box a little bit bigger. Two, 13. Okay, here we go. Can't do more than seven. But that's a fixable thing in principle. So here you can do minus. Seven. So that's in principle a fixable thing if we just make the, the dimension large enough, right? Because you need to make sure you have enough elements in your plane. So, so I can't accommodate 213 minus 9, but how about 5 and minus 7? Let's see what the code does. I mean, this certainly is not something I've done before. And it's running this, it's sending this simulation to the server, it's getting the results back. It's well, here, see, it's running the Nemo input deck and it's processing the results. And let's see what it looks like. Okay, so here are is the crystal on one side of the plane. So this is supposedly what two minus five no five seven so without further guidance i'm not sure so this is on one side this is the other side of a plane so it it, it this tool works i mean this visualization is somewhat different than what we have here but um if there is a need to make these um like larger miller plane indices uh, for for various aspects in principle, the, the code can be updated for that, sure. But right now, I'd say I have to punt. So you've seen the limitations. Yeah, and this is um, big cell. So I made it quite big. Yeah. Here is the plane, and it's not drawing the whole thing. Maybe that is part of the issue. Okay. So, partial punt, I would say. All right, great. Thank you, Jack, for the question. I think Amy, Amy has the next one lined up. Yeah, so we have someone who uses Crystal Maker Suite, and they're asking, does Abacus have any additional features that Crystal Maker does not? I haven't looked at Crystal Maker for quite a while. So, um, I don't remember, but I think Crystal Maker, as far as I can tell, if what I remember, it was it took a little while to to make the crystal and assemble it versus crystal viewer is sort of pre-cooked more or less um, available standard crystals 
And if I remember right, crystal makers can make more complex crystals as well of multiple atoms, etc. I I'm, I might be wrong. So it's a it's a slightly different approach to uh, doing this visualization. Um, I presume it might be also more interesting from a material scientist point of view, because from, you know, I'm a poor semiconductor physicist, right? What we care about is silicon and, and the material of the future, gallium arsenide, and it will always be in the future. So, so we're, so we're a bit geared towards silicon, gallium arsenide, zinc blender type things. The other stuff is, is good to know. So it's, it's a little bit of a different view of the world, if you will. All right, thanks. The next one is, do all apps allow data to be output to a file, for example, image text or CSV? Yes. yes. Um, it depends on the app of what data is being handled. Uh, most of the outputs in these apps, so just to make sure you understand, this crystal viewer by itself is here embedded in this Abacus toolset. It itself is an app on NanoHub. You can find it and it started in there. So all of the Rapture-based apps, that's our framework for 90% of the apps on NanoHub thereabouts, use this framework, you have this download button here. So you have all these different output elements here that a specific tool might give, and they vary very widely between tool and tool, but but the UI, the user interface is similar. So so let's let's look at um, this tool is a bit unusual, right? It it has um, a couple of outputs. You can uh, output the VTK data and then visualize it in your own VTK install. And VTK data, if you're familiar with it, it gets you the coordinates, etc. And it can also give you the image file. And uh, if I do that, it downloads it onto your local machine. And you can grab this thing and drag it over, say, in a Word document, for example. So you can get that. So it depends on what is the output. Um, here is some um, crystal info. So this is a text file. So you can, depending on what that is, you can just download the text file. There's only one option. And just so I answer the question also say for more complicated or more standard things like, um, for example, here, PN Junction Lab, if I launch that and run a PN Junction, the output there might be curves, right? And uh, you can uh, get the data as CSV. So you can get it like this. And here we go is the output of these various curves. Or you can also again, oops, um, click on this and get the image. So it generates the image. And actually, this should ask, um, oh, download. Ask for different formats. You can get it in PS, you can get it in, in PDF, EPS, JPEG, PNG. You can configure the axis. So you can actually generate uh, publication level qual uh, quality graphs that have decent labels and graphics and that export well into, say, EPS, into Illustrator or other post processing mechanisms. So so early on, I insisted that we can also generate publication uh, quality graphs uh, right out of Rapture. And that's true for all the Rapture tools. It just depends on what is the data set you have under the hood. I hope that answered the question. All right, thanks. The next question is, sometimes it can be very instructive for the students to see the actual sizes covalent radii. Can this be done as well? Um, the actual sizes, I think we treat this mostly as a parameter. So, let's see. Uh, 
Uh, definitely not in the new web version. Let me look here. I believe at some point we had the ability to check on that. Yes, so that's what I, element elements is atom scale. You can scale that up like this to 1.0. So that's the atom scale, and you the atom radii would be set then to, to, to the covalent uh, representation. And then you have your um, silicon crystal like this. It would be interesting now, and I'm going on to thin ice here, right? So, but never too old to make a fool of myself. Let's try gallium arsenide, and there we should see different uh, atoms, and then it becomes relevant right, to your question for students to see the space filling aspect of your crystal. So let's see what comes up here. And I'm going to set this to 0. 0.0 scale. I don't know how far that goes. Opacity 100, quality, it's more rendering quality. And I would have expected these atoms to be of different size, and that is not the case. So, I would say that is something we we should be working on where it's not just a rendering thing, but it actually has for each different atom the proper sort of ball and stick size. Let me see. That's just a rendering piece. Well, that seems like a cool thing to make sure we have it where actually the, the atom scale corresponds to sort of a nominal radius. Is that the question ultimately what you like to see? Because I actually, on the previous version, I know I did that and I use it in my class, but the latest version does not have the atom scaling in it. Probably. Was that the question you were asking? Um, there's a follow up and I might mispronounce some of these. He said, yes, that was the question he was asking. And maybe GAs is very similar. I N N should be better. G A G A A S. Gallium arsenide. And indium G -A -A nitride. Oh, indium nitride. So let's, let's go out on a thin ice here. Indium nitride should be short side, right? Or do you mean, let's see. Let's see what we find. While this is running, I just want to let everyone know that we are getting a lot of questions coming in. I don't know that we will get to them all, um, but we will copy and paste them into the group forum on the Abacus group page. Uh, so we invite you to you know, follow along in the forum as well after this recitation. Um, and we will make sure to get those questions answered if if time does not Ooh, allow. Look at this. Here we go. The atoms are at the different size. Yay, yay, yay. So gallium and arsenide have very similar sizes because they're. Hey, look at this. I don't look like a total fool. Awesome. Here we go. And then put up the bond a little bit more too. And here we go. Let me clear this and rerun it. Uh, what that does, it, it rescales the, the three-dimensional plane for rendering. Here we go. And I'll go back in here. 
So here, uh, the atoms on the right scale. And thank you for the pointer. You helped me not to look like a fool. So awesome. Because I know I had done this in the past. So here we go. Indium nitride. We can do it. Yay. What's the next question? I have another question for you, Gerhard. Sure. How do you yeah. how do you count the number of dangling bonds for different orientation for SI? For silicon. Um so I have some assignment like this where I, I would just um I would take silicon here and I would explore different planes and you can shift the plane so um we can literally count the bonds that are intersecting on those planes. So and then you and you can count the atoms or you can just shift it ever so slightly. And um it'll shift the plane. I've shifted too much. And you can let the students count the number of bonds that are crossing. That would be one way of doing it. Um, in the other older tool, it actually shows like half the crystal one way, the other half of the crystal the other way. It has two different views. And I would love to hear what people use and what they like to use, whether we should implement that also here in the newer version. So I would do this. I hope that answers part of the question. And then you can, of course, choose the different different uh, planes as well, the 110 plane, for example, and you have different, even different directional bonds, right, this way. Maybe move to the next question. I hope that answered it. Yeah, next question. Can we represent new material like uh, SIC in this tool? It is a hexagon layered material. So we 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 did play with that a little bit. So um, MOS2, for example, is a lately a material of interest. So we have a couple of more esoteric materials out here. Um, we don't have a way, if I remember right, to read in a crystal structure. We kind of took that out of the tool. View a material or create your own crystal. Look at that. So it's still in the in the version here. So you can uh, you can construct um, uh, different atom sets, planes, etc. Um, it would be by hand. Um, it would be interesting to also read in, um, say, um, unit cells that that come from say research codes, right? Um, if that's a requirement for for some of the material scientists under you. It will be an interesting one to see if we can uh, work on that. But it, it's not quite here. I mean, entering the coordinates like this, you can do it. Uh, certainly, I mean, you can basically put in any Bravi vector, right? And and you construct anything you want. Okay, next question. Is there a way to show the density of bonds crossing a plane bonds per unit area? Um, other than visualizing it and calculating the density by hand, no, it's, there's not like a numerical output that would, would give that, if that's what's need, uh, needed. I mean, uh, that, that stuff, in a sense, I have students do in homework assignment, create the density of bonds per area or something like this. I have them calculate that, but it's not built uh, into the tool per se. Okay, next question. Um, I use Vesta for crystal structure model viewing. Does the crystal modeling tool in Abacus connect to the computational side of things? Can I upload CIF files or POSCAR or similar to feed into the EPROP computation? Uh, no, not right now. Um, what this is feeding off is the, the nano-electronic modeling tool that 
that came out of my research group. And that tool is actually kind of excited to tell the story. It's actually designing transistors for silver, uh, for Intel today. And it, we need all these crystal structures and abilities in there. But we don't have a connection to other file formats. Again, I would say if that is what the community would require and find useful, that is a project we can try to undertake as a community, and I'd be very happy to be involved. All right, the next question. Thank you for the introduction to Abacus. Are there tools available for resonant tunneling diodes? Oh, yeah, my best friend. Yay! <laughs> Yes. I mean, I, I spent four years at Texas Instruments modeling resonant tunneling diodes. Um, and we, we I think, ultimately built a best available tool for this. And we have something similar in Nanob. Um, while I fire this up, can I get the next question? Yes, the next question is, I am running the PN Junction Lab. What is the physical limitation of the current tool in terms of junction size? For example, when I set a 0.01 .01 micrometer on a PNN side with zero bias voltage, I am not getting any IV curve out. Ah. Well, the PN Junction Lab, which is, let me pull this up here is based on Padre, which is a semi-classical tool. So if you push uh, the, the, the device lengths really down, you have to make sure you also have enough mesh nodes here to really resolve a really sharp um, uh, gradient. Um, and then the question is, do you need an extension to really also have sort of um, proper injection of carriers? So what was the structure? Make it really tiny, 0.1 what? 0.1 micron? Uh, 0 0.01 micrometer. Well, yeah, that's in the nanometer range, right? So let me see what I find here. I would I would not expect the tool to do it so well because um, right here you need. Let me just um, first let me see what comes out if I do zero bias. Let's look at this thing in equilibrium. Okay, fine. First of all, I want to see what the band structure looks like when it's in equilibrium. Um, while this runs, I'm going to go into my best friend here and show you a resonant tunneling diode, double barrier structure, typical structure of 555 nanometers, uh, separator from high, bar, uh, from high doping. I'll let this run as well. And while this one is cooking, I go back to the other one here. Uh, Yeah, so I am not totally surprised that this will not work very well. Um, yeah, I mean, 0 0.1 nanometer in a semi-classical tool, I would bet that some of the meshing breaks down in a semi-classical tool. You need... I mean, what are the boundary conditions? Do you have metal on the other side on something that is 10 nanometers, 10 nanometers? What's the physical structure? What's the physics that you're modeling here? Because it's hard to imagine that you have a 10 nanometer on one side, 10 nanometer on the other side, PN junction. There must be something on the on the edges that help you establish some sort of equilibrium and, and boundary condition, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if this tool is going to have a hard time with that. It's really a semi-classical, huge device tool. It's actually designed transistors for Bell Labs some 15, 20 years ago. So it, this is a semi-classical tool. If you have 10 nanometers, I mean, you have quantized states and all kinds of things. 
in there, right? So none of this would be comprehended in a classical tool. I hope I answered there, some aspect of your question. There is a bit of follow up. Is there any is there a way to change the mesh setting? Yeah, you can the, what you can do is increase the mesh nodes. Um, if you truly want to dive into the code, you can look at here's um, input parameters. If you really want to do advanced modeling based on drift diffusion, I would suggest you go to this tool here. Nanohub Tools Padre. And that is really the engine that drives all of this. And if you launch this tool, it gives you truly good, honest to goodness, the 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 input deck of a um, of what I just simulated here. And you can uh, mess around with meshing to your heart's delight. Again, this is going to be semi-classical, no quantum at all. And in this next tool, you'll see if you have 10 nanometer anything, like here, 5 nanometer, 5 nanometer, 5 nanometer, you have quantized uh, effects, no doubt. So here's the resonant tunneling diode, resonant state here, transmission, here's the IV. And you can sort of ramp through this IV. And what's shown here is uh, the resonance now meeting roughly the Fermi C current is at its peak. And I'm plotting here blue with the transmission, green, the current density as a function of energy, it decreases as a function of Fermi level. And here the integral over the current. So you see all of the current flows through the lower resonance. And then as you pull this resonance here under this emitter, current will go down and increases and now all the current is not flowing through the ground state it's flowing through the excited state and that's what this uh, green line here indicates so yes we can do resonant tunneling diodes i have a winner we can do it and yes students need to create a nano hub account and it's free you just go up here i'm logged in and you create a, a free nano hub account and they can Typically, also log in with a university um, uh, uh, accreditation. There's a shibboleth um, login. I just saw that question here. Any other questions? Uh, we I mean, do can... have a, f a few more questions. Can we design oh, new can... crystals? New crystals. Can we design new crystals by choosing atoms? Ooh, yeah, it's not. It is not that general, I, I'm afraid. I mean, it's what I remember is you can, oh, here we go. It's in here. I can go back to the crystal viewer. It's basically limited to constructing things from Brave vectors. Um, and you can have certain atoms here and you can you can have a periodic table here. Uh, and you can cha change uh, basis, right? You can have three. And then you get uh, an assemble, you get three different atoms. You say, uh, state the basis vectors and the distance from each other. So anything you can construct in a Brave sense um by basis number of basis states and basis vectors which is the principle of crystals you can assemble it i hope that answers that actually i wanted to thank the the audience for making time at uh, maybe that's taking time away from your family dinner or you're making your commute uh, more difficult um so i thank you for attending and i'll i'll gladly take more questions All right, our next question, is there a provision for the students to visualize the density of broken bonds if one is interested in a high index arbitrary crystallographic orientation? In general here, I don't deal with broken bonds. I think that's more of a material science area and and we don't mess around with that in at least the semiconductor courses I'm teaching. So I have not tackled that. I mean, the high index milliplanes that we just showed are limited, and that's fixable. 
I mean, we can those that might be a matter of actually just a parameter in the user interface or making sure the unit sizes are large enough. But dealing with a broken bond per se, that I'm not even sure how to handle. All right. The next question, is there a way of showing the recycle lattice of any of the commonly encountered crystals such as diamond, zinc blend, HCP, etc.? Awesome question. And that that really means I we should add there is a tool on NanoUp that does that. Um, There is a tool that, for some reason, I didn't include in in the abacus tool seed, and I could, no problem. So here is a your primitive cell, and it can construct the the Brion zone. And here we go. Yes, and what else do we have? We have this typical ones. Uh, so BCC primitive, uh, FCC primitive, uh, hexagonal, can look cute. Um, so yes, we have it. And this is a great reminder. I should embed this Brion zone viewer in the, um, in the abacus tool set. No problem. All right. The next question. Can one model a bioimpedance measurement setup? Um, maybe with some of the tools on NanoHub. That's certainly not, it's more of a researchy question. That's certainly not in the, in the Abacus tool set, which we're, we're touting here. And I would have to ask my, my bio friends, um, what can be done on nano up i am not familiar very familiar with those tools but we can follow up with you and see if we can connect you to say professor alam or some contributors from the university of illinois that might do such a thing and for me everything is solid state not wiggly like bio it's, that's that's my background but that doesn't mean it's not in there in any of the 600 tools. There might be something. I just am not knowledgeable about that. All right. Our next question, is there a way to use offline? No. Everything here uh, you see is an online tool. Um, yes, everything. I mean, the gray screen here is a, a screen dump uh, from a virtual session, VNC session on some remote computer. And even this, I mean, I could disconnect my computer from the network now and play with my existing results that I have loaded. But as soon as I try to say, look at uh, other results where I change a setting, it would want to talk to a server. There's nothing embedded here in the front end on, on your local machine that would compute anything. So you can preload this, the set of results you're interested in and disconnect your computer from the network. Um, but as soon as you say change a setting here and you make this device say symmetric, for argument's sake and say I want to see the band structure, it's going to go off on the server and try to either compute the result or retrieve a pre-computed result. And that certainly requires network. So this, these are not standalone apps that say run without a network, say in your phone, for example. All right, next question. Regarding device simulation capabilities, is there a provision for us to simulate the IVs of a specific type of device, such as HEMTs or CABETs? HEMTs, High Electromobility Transistors, HEMTs. And what is the second acronym? A CABET. 
C A D E P. Not even sure what that is. C A D E T Cavit. So we, I think we have some tools that do hems. Um, you can do certainly the hem layout. There's a tool called NanoHub Tools. The hetero where you can lay out um might be easier to just look at the screenshots so you can you can lay out different layers uh, of of materials and then you can look at the band structure that you might have in this uh, hemp uh, device and if i remember right there might be uh, actually a hemp modeling tool I don't know. Oh, it's this is the MIT virtual source model. It's moment that, yeah, that is somewhat of a tool where you can um, you have like a two, 2D uh, device like um, but it's not a true hemp per se I would say this is a double gate or single gate device it's an HFET um, so I, I know there was a MESFET at some point a colleague of mine created a MESFET don't really remember But again, I don't, uh, there we go, mess that. Yeah, Dragica was driving that. So here's a mess that device, and maybe you can coerce it to be a uh, hemp like thing. Hope that answers the question. Again, these are things that are. Not necessarily stuff I would cover in my semiconductor course, so but we can talk more about those things as well. All right, the next question is Padre tool similar to Silvaco TCAD or not? Yes. So it's interesting you asked that. Um, so I mean, if you if you know about the heritage of these tools, there's a few sort of um, grandparents and Padre and the Silvaco and uh, TMA are, are related to each other and their input text read very much alike. And we're actually in the process of bringing in the Silvaco tools as well. So we'll sometime soon have Silvaco tools running under the hood in these apps or even fully in NanoHub. But Padre is comparable to their uh, Victory TCAD tool suite for devices in the semi classical range. So it's comparable. And for the, for the scope of teaching and simple devices, it'll get exactly the same result, I would think. Okay, our next question. Uh, these tools are awesome. Speaking of resonant tunnel diodes, can we also simulate a tunnel junctions with one or two quantum wells inserted into the junction? This is a current topic I've been reading about in multi-junction solar cells. So uh, we have some solar cell type tools. Uh, most of them are more classical type things. Um, you can probably conjure up a, uh, a tunneling simulation that might um, quote unquote resonate with that. Um, yeah. So this tool does allow you to um, have multi barrier devices. So you can have a three barrier device like this and you can play around with that and mess with a doping, etc. And mess with the so here's the doping and the mole fraction and the barrier heights, etc. So there's some things you can do. Uh, I don't think there's a code 
designated to doing solar cells with um, multiple quantum wells in it, etc. But there might be tools around. Certainly, the Nemo tool in principle can be configured for that. But but you have to. It's not a. It's not an app like what we're having here. But it, it's a research question you're asking me here. All right, if we're ready for the next question. Uh, this one's more of a comment. Thanks for these great teaching tools. Even though my students are comfortable with the concept of normal vector to a plane, they get rather confused when we apply it to a crystal. It would be nice to show directions in addition to Miller planes. Uh, interesting. That let's we, we keep track of these chats, right? So these are great opportunities to make this tool better. Yes. So you want it to have a vector pointing out of the plane and, and giving it a label. I think. It was a yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another comment, I too would love the Bruin zone viewer in the abacus tool set. Awesome. Done deal. That is almost trivial for me to do. It's I'm I'm adding it. I would have to edit an, a slight a small file and um and and republish the tool. That is an easy easy edit. So this is great feedback. Thank you. All right, and we might have already talked about this in another question. Can we view reciprocal lattice? Well, we can view the Brion zone. Uh, I presume that tool could be conjured up to also then show the reciprocal lattice, and, and it might be. I haven't looked at this in forever. A postdoc of mine did this quite a while ago. Let me see. Here we are. Brion zone. BTK output. Real space structure. So let me make sure I'm going here. It might dump out the uh, reciprocal ladder. So here's the Brion zone. And FCC in cubic indices. Space centered. Yeah, this is just the, the real space one. That's not the reciprocal space. But that isn't, strikes me as something that should be easily addable in this tool. I'm not sure I have staff for doing that because my Nemo team is now really tiny, but this could be done and that would be really cool, I would agree, to not just show the Brion zone, but actually also show the reciprocal lattice. Yeah, that would be cool. I agree. All right, that is the end of the questions that we have received. Cool. So then there's one um, tool other than the um, RTD tool. I want to show you also this tool, the quantum.lab. And I wonder how many people are interested in such a thing, because I'm using that for a project assignment in my class where you can say have just a particle in a box, or you can have a pyramidal quantum dot and and run this here. And now you can visualize your your pyramidal dot. Here's your ground state, excited state, other direction, and this cool states to visualize. And you can look at absorption coefficients, etc. So there were some people that were teaching quantum mechanics. And so quantum dots are just awesome uh, venues to teach some quantum mechanics, where you look at symmetries of states, etc. and calculate um, emission coefficients, etc. Um, absorption lines, etc. So I wanted to highlight that. All right. Thank you, Gerhard. All right.